My name is Ross Daly. I'm a musician and a person of what you might call a transcultural identity. By this, I simply mean that the circumstances of my life from my very earliest years have taken me to various different parts of the world as a resident, not merely as a visitor, and that I really don't feel able to describe myself within the context of any one given particular ethnic or regional identity. To put it simply, I've had the extreme good fortune to have lived my life in the native environments of many different cultures, each of which has influenced me to an almost equal degree. And all of this results in my feeling all of them to be mine. When I say mine, however, I don't mean this in a possessive sense. It's not a question of them belonging to me, as it is a question of me belonging to them. Please excuse my choice to speak in my native language English today. This is not because this is easier for me but because the culmination of this talk is actually a rather specific proposal which I feel could potentially be of interest to people in other regions of the world, not just here in Greece, and that through the medium of the internet, where this talk will probably end up, more people will be able to hear it, which in what has, for better or worse, come to be the lingua franca of our age, the English language. As I said previously, I'm a musician, a musician, however, somewhat obsessed for many decades with what many would consider to be a rather obscure interest, modal music. Throughout all my life, I have been interested in and uh, inspired by this genre of music and its multitude of manifestations. I discovered this interest at a relatively early age, I must have been about 14 years old at the time, after hearing a, co a concert of one of the world's major modal traditions, North Indian classical music performed by one of its greatest exponents of the time, the late Sarod Virtuoso Ustad Aliak Parkhan. This concert took place in a relatively small theatre at a college just south of San Francisco where I was living at the time. Up until then, I had been studying as a child cello and during my adolescence, classical and contemporary guitar styles. After this, listening to this concert of Indian classical music, however, despite the fact that the music played was obviously quite new to my ears, I immediately felt a strange affinity for and even familiarity with it. It touched me in a way such as I had never previously experienced and on a level far deeper than any other previous musical experience of mine. On returning home after the concert, I tried as best as I could to reproduce some of the sounds which I had heard on my guitar, but I quickly realized that in order to play this music, I would need to have an instrument specifically designed for it. So, this single concert, together with my newfound desire to study such an instrument, marked the beginning of what would become for me a very long journey through various regions of the world, studying under the guidance of some of the greatest masters of the various traditions belonging to the broader world of modal music. My travels and studies took me to many places, and during the course of my research, I began to get a clear picture of something which I get the impression not many people in the Western world seem to be aware of. The world of modal music extends roughly from Western Africa to Western China and encompasses almost everything in between. Not only does this seem to be true, but all of the many and extremely varied traditions found in this vast geographical re region seem to be interconnected in a way such as to render them somehow familiar and even accessible to almost all of the region's inhabitants. For example, a piece of what we call Mugam music played by an Uyghur ensemble from Western China would sound strangely familiar to a Moroccan just as a piece of Naubat music performed by a Moroccan ensemble would not sound entirely foreign to an Uyghur from Kashgar. A German or a Belgian, on the other hand, would most likely find nothing at all familiar, let alone accessible in either of these examples. The more I delved into these various musical traditions, the more I came to realize that there is a clear and traceable historical dimension extending over several millennia to this vast musical community of modality. So at this point, perhaps I should give a concise definition of exactly what modal music is. Modal music is quite simply a genre which employs and focuses on the use of modes. Modes, however, are surprisingly difficult to, actual, to accurately define. They are often regarded as mere tone material or scales, much as people in the West regard major and minor scales. These scales, which are perceived as being many in number, 
some traditions actually count in the hundreds. Apart from using what, for a Western ear, are strange tonal configurations, also make use of intervals which, uh, which belong to what we call a non-tempered nature. To put it simply, this means that they don't just have the tempered scale of Western music, which is an octave comprised of 12 equidistant semitones. Rather, they have a whole gamut of other intervals, deriving from very specific and precise mathematical calculations, which open up a vast array of equally precise melodic and subsequently expressive possibilities. However, to define these modes as mere scales comes nowhere near to comprehending their true nature. These modes, in various languages, are referred to as ragas. In Indian music, the word raga derives from the Sanskrit word for color. Makams, in Middle Eastern and Central Asian music, the Arabic term makam denotes a position, level or station, referring equally to levels of spiritual development as to musical modes. Ichos, the Greek word which generically refers to sound, is used to refer to the modes in Byzantine church music. Or tropos, in ancient Greek, the term for a mode was tropos, a multifaceted term which refers to a manner, a style, a dimension of logic, or even in some circumstances, that which is in a state of change or flux. These terms, as well as many others in other languages, clearly denote something which is far more co comprehensive than a mere scale. A well-known Persian musicologist once gave the following definition of modes, which I've always found very helpful in clarifying the issue. If we have a line of a fixed length beginning at point A and ending at point B, and if we say that point A is tone material, a scale, and that point B is a full-fledged uh, melody, then all modes find themselves somewhere on this line in between those two. Some are closer to being scales, some are closer to being full-fledged melodies, but neither can be defined by uh, one of these two aspects alone. They require both aspects. Modes are very much concerned with musical phrasing. These phrases are often very simple, but highly flexible in nature, each one acting as a melodic nucleus which can extend and expand into various forms and manifestations, whilst always remaining clearly recognizable to those who have acquired an acquaintance with them. Perhaps the best analogy that I can give would be to say that becoming acquainted with a mode is very much like, like making the acquaintance of a person. This, of course, is a very complex and comprehensive time-consuming process, which requires that we creatively employ all of our senses and faculties. The same is true of getting to know a musical mode. In light of this analogy, we could say that trying to understand modes by simply studying scales is like trying to get to know people by studying skeletons. It's just not the way to go. As I said previously, Modal music is prevalent throughout a vast geographical area and the network of relationships between its various ethnic and regional manifestations are clear to see both from the point of view of historical analysis as well as being self-evident to even a relatively untrained ear. Unraveling this intricate and extremely complicated network of cross-influences over the centuries and even millennia is a singularly difficult task which even today is anything but complete. Suffice it to say, however, that what quickly becomes evident to anyone studying these musical idioms is that the richness and beauty of each depends integrally on a continuing flow of influences coming and going, ebbing and flowing, rather like the tides of a vast sea. This process, in many ways, also resembles that of cross-pollination in the plant world, and indeed I've often found the analogy of regional variety in the plant world to to be relevant to that of modal music in particular. Often a phrase or a mode can come into being in one region and spread like pollen or even as a seed to another region where it will mingle, mingle with other organisms and eventually blossom according to the circumstances of the new environment. It's perhaps for this reason that I've always regarded music more as a natural phenomenon than as a specifically human creation, as something which comes through people and not necessarily from them. As for the source, each can name it as he or she will, and some, perhaps the wiser, prefer to leave it unnamed. One interesting 
an often confusing detail about the region of the world in which we live here is that it is home to a number of contemporary nation-states with extremely ancient names. Greece, Egypt, Syria, Israel, Armenia, Persia, India, etc. All of which, however, as nation-states, as political entities, are considerably younger than Australia. This fact doesn't sit comfortably for those who have taken it upon themselves to craft the cultural profiles of these states, a process which often results in the delineation of a somewhat narrow, unusually seriously distorted, ethnocentric cultural stereotype, which as a rule insistently stresses the absence of any foreign influences. This tendency unfortunately seems to have dominated cultural attitudes throughout the recent history of the region. The confusion between grassroots regional or ethnic identity and top-down state-crafted cultural stereotypes has often proven to be highly problematic and in some cases to be very ugly indeed. In any case, however, it has certainly proven to be counterproductive with regard to the continuing inter-regional flow of influences so necessary for the continued flourishing of the region's rich musical traditions. It is, of course, true that most people in all of the countries in question do usually have at least a fair knowledge of their own local culture, but they equally have little, if any, knowledge of the culture of their immediate neighbors. Add to this the rather heavy-handed cultural hegemony frequently exert exerted by the Western world, resulting in anomalies such as massive numbers of the youth of the region being fully informed down to the last detail about Lady Gaga's late latest hit, but without a clue as to what their neighbor next door is doing culturally. So now to my specific proposal. If any of the cultures of the region in question are to be able to continue to give rise to inspiring cultural prototypes, which will encourage full-fledged artistic, artistic participation in them by their very own people, this will necessitate a similar network of intercultural exchange and dialogue as that which existed in the past. A similar exchange and dialogue as that which in previous ages gave rise to the remarkable individual traditions which we still encounter, albeit in a state of relative stagnation and in some, some cases actual decay. At best, many of these traditions have been relegated to the role of folkloric relics, and at worst to that of cheap fodder for an even cheaper pop culture, which is little more than a poor imitation of the not-so-enviable pop culture of the Western world. The rekindling of this dialogue actually requires a whole new cultural perspective on the part of all of its participants, a perspective which entails a complete rethinking of what is generally perceived as cultural politics in general. For a start, it is necessary for all to clearly recognize that any form of cultural inter interaction, by definition, is a process of give and take. It is an exchange. Regrettably, however, Official cultural policies, especially in our region of the world, seem to overstress the give and to understate the take. In other words, everyone seems to be very proud of the, what you might call masculine, or as the Chinese would say, yang aspect of their culture. That which de disseminates, which influences others, the assertive aspect. But they also seem to want to play down the somewhat, the, the feminine or the yin aspect, the receptive, accepting, or assimilating aspect. It's as though they feel their identity, be, identity to be affirmed by the fact that they have influenced others and that it is somehow negated and lost when they are influenced by others. This attitude, however, is quite simply unrealistic. If we are not able to assimilate and work creatively with, with that which is offered to us, what hope do we really have of actually having something to give when our turn to do so comes? Unless, of course, we believe in virgin births, which for the last 2014 years at least don't seem to have been a very regular occurrence. In culture, and most specifically in the arts, every creative act is the result of the interplay of give and take. And it really is that simple. For many years now, I have been the artistic director at the Musical Workshop Labyrinth, currently situated in the village of Hudetsi here on Crete. One of our primary activities at Labyrinth is the organization on a regular basis of seminars and master classes focusing on the various modal musical traditions of the world. Throughout our many years of activity, 
We have been host to literally dozens of some of modal music's greatest masters, as well as to thousands of students. During this time, we ourselves, however, have never sought to actually promote one culture or another. We don't even try to promote modal music in general. All that we do is to give to all who come to us a place and a chance to be themselves and to interact on equal terms with all of the others with as little interference as possible from either ourselves or anyone else. The result has inevitably been that each one discovers the other, or to be more precise, the others, in his or her own time and manner, and each gradually establishes a dialogue, often leading to a full-fledged cooperation or collaboration with the others according to his or her own needs and nature. I could recount literally for hours all that I've witnessed at Labyrinth over the years, reflecting the amazing ability of people to interact amongst themselves with people of different cultural, religious and ethnic backgrounds, but there's no time for that right now. Suffice it to say, however, that any intelligent person can't help but to realize that the only viable future for our world is simply this, increased cooperation between different people of different backgrounds on equal terms in the service of a goal which is clearly beneficial to all. Applying this general axiom to my obsession, modal music, I sincerely believe that the island of Crete, where we find ourselves today, in the very middle of the Mediterranean, with cultural ties to and good relations with East and West, North and South, is an ideal location to host, with courtesy, subtlety and humility, just such a many-sided dialogue which is so necessary for the continued cultural integrity and viability of all concerned. As I said previously, I've seen this in practice on a small, small scale at Labyrinth in Hudetsi. Not only how the individual musicians integrate harmoniously amongst themselves, but also very importantly, how the Cretan people themselves, with their long history of hospitality and creative assimilation of a myriad of cultural influences, respond in a very positive way to just such a challenge. It's no mere coincidence that people from as far afield as Afghanistan, North Africa, the Arabian Peninsula, Transcaucasia, the Balkans, Turkey, India, Spain, and countless other regions of the vast geographical area in which we find modal music all felt very much at home here. Very important also is that Crete, the music of Crete itself clearly belongs to this greater family of modal traditions. Who knows? Perhaps if we're able to successfully establish such a dialogue and cooperation, focusing on the humble subject of modal musical traditions, it might even serve as a good example for the establishment of a similar dialogue relevant to other issues rather more critical to, to our survival as a species. Thank you very much.